We're going to dive into institutional and the potential of its impact on the market, especially going forward. Have we hit a bottom within outflows, Bitcoin's current price? We'll kind of lay it all out for you guys today. I think you'll like it. My name is Paul Bear. Welcome back into Tech Path. I do want to thank our uh, sponsor today. That is iTrust Capital. I trust Capital, one of the best places to go for your crypto IRA. And as you start to get into your tax planning for 2024 and starting to go into 2025, obviously you want to check with your own tax attorneys and, and your own you know CPAs on whether or not uh, an IRA is perfect for you. But if you if it is a good match, which a lot of people are going this direction, use our link down below. It's going to give you a hundred dollar funding reward, and you guys can get started on your own crypto IRA. Joining me today is Tim Ogilvy. He is the global head of institutional over at Kraken. Great to have you, Tim. Thanks for having me, Paul. Great to be yeah, here. Yeah, so we're, we're going to dive into a lot. Obviously, there's but a bunch of news uh, within where Bitcoin is going. We've seen a little bit of softness in the market. Here's uh, my friend Scott over there talking about the spot Bitcoin ETF recording its largest outflow since May. So we saw that as being a, a pretty big factor. But I don't know, and I'm kind of curious when you look at that, and obviously you guys get a chance to see some of the uh, activity on uh, Kraken there, but do you feel that we are in a position right now for institutional, because that's mostly institutional money right now, that they are confident in the trek forward around the Bitcoin ETF? What's your thought? Well, I think that the biggest thing we've seen over the, the 2024 has been that most hedge funds have wrapped their head around the BTC ETFs and how to use them in their portfolio. And so rather than I think thinking about, is this a crypto specific issue or, or something else? I think a lot of it is more a, where is the, the broader market acting today and how right. do people position themselves vis-a-vis -vis risk? And I think, uh, you know, Bitcoin for better or worse has not had an uncorrelated 2024. It's looked a whole lot like a tech stock in that this is a risk on asset. People are in a little bit more of a risk off mode in a lot of ways. And so I think we've seen less activity in, in the Bitcoin ETFs and even more so in the ETH ETFs. Well, I think the, uh, the scenario that this plays out too, when you look at institutional capital in general is the amount or the position that they put themselves in from, um, you know, a portfolio standpoint. Have you seen any scenarios that are showing trends where people are leveraging more into their portfolio, meaning, you know, leveling up in terms of whether it's the ETH ETF or a Bitcoin ETF, just crypto in general, maybe looking at a mixed offering where they're raising their percentage of exposure. Is that something that is trending up or kind of flat right now? Ooh. We see, we see a, obviously a broad spectrum of points of view on this stuff. I think um, we do not see a ton of retail activity going on. On the institutional side, I think most people are positioning in more of a, certainly before the Fed announcements, right. more in a, a risk off position. I think we're yeah. now seeing people, Arthur Hayes is one of them, who's on the negative side of things. We see other people who, who view the Fed's you know, coming actions as to be pretty bullish for Bitcoin and crypto. And so I think people are positioning themselves on both sides of that. Uh, I think overall we're down a little bit, but I think you know, you're, you're basically seeing people position on both sides of that activity. Yeah, with this, uh, this is kind of an interesting tweet here from Eleanor. Uh, over a Fox business, it uh, doesn't bode well that nearly all crypto ETF issuers have the same custodian for the Bitcoin and ETH. This makes Coinbase a potential single point of failure. This is being looked at right now across the markets as especially these kinds of um, interest levels start to come into it. BlackRock, of course, one of the majors out there with iBit and others. Do you think that has any bearing on the crypto market is the centralization of where these ETFs, granted, they only carry a small percentage of the overall crypto market, especially around yeah. Bitcoin. Is that an impact at all? I think it's I think it's a scary proposition for crypto where the core message is you have a, a decentralized and fully distributed form of, of money. If if you look at all of the assets held at something like Kraken and within Kraken custody, it's a big number. Um, that gets a little nerve wracking. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, of other qualified custodians that we work with 
or that can provide options for the ETF issuers. But Coinbase has done a terrific job early on of, of aggregating a lot of that liquidity. I think what you should, what I'd expect to see over the coming months is most of those ETF issuers are very aware of the issue and will diversify what they're doing to other right. custodians. All right. Well, that would that, I think that would ease a little bit of the concern, you know, in the yeah, market yours and mine both, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of Arthur Hayes, he was on an article here explaining why Fed rate cuts, and I want to talk about the Fed in itself in a second. He had a couple of points of saying that the rate cuts may not necessarily be a big benefit. He's kind of going at the angle from the repos that might offer a, a new haven for those who have been somewhat, uh, I'll say, you know, dovish in going into whether it's money markets or bonds. When you look at that, do you feel that 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 is the angle some of these institutional investors will take as opposed to maybe looking at some risk on activity uh, once that we get a rate cut going forward. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, Arthur had a very sophisticated and, and interesting point of view on this as it relates to where dollars go to, to chase yield. Uh, but I think there is the broader picture here, which is that um, if you have a Fed that's going to no longer take an aggressive position fighting inflation. Mm -hmm. You have the prospect of more money printing in the US. You have both sides of the election lining up and basically saying, we're going to continue the money printing approach in the US. I think all of that is, is a very strong argument for Bitcoin and, and crypto more broadly is going to have a very healthy end of 24 and into 25. Arthur's kind of hedging against that with with a notion that, hey, you can, you can get better yields in, in reverse repos, yeah. which is probably yeah. right. But I think the I think the broader things are, are in my view, is, is likely to be more active. And a lot of our clients have the, the same point of view. You look at that and uh, some of the moves that are being made now within the traditional finance sector. Here's uh, Wells Fargo who has you know, 1.7 trill under uh, management right now, basically saying they're gonna give their wealth advisors the green light you know, on Bitcoin yeah. ETFs as a recommendation. So this is starting to move, I would say, pretty fast if you think about an ETF that's not even a year old yet, and the likelihood of seeing more institutional capacity starting to flow in. Granted, we had a big outflow uh, yesterday yep. within the Bitcoin ETFs, but this could be setting up a very interesting 2025. When you look at what Wells Fargo is doing and possibly other you know, asset managers out there, do you think this is just a wave of potential liquidity coming at this market? What are your thoughts? I think these are, these are just responses to customer demand, right? This is Wells Fargo saying, our customers have been beating down our door for a way to invest in Bitcoin and Ethereum for years we're finally giving them the ability to do so. Morgan Stanley had a similar point of view uh, a couple weeks or months back. Uh, you know, I think I think the big unlock here is actually yet to come, and, and you mentioned it, it could be a very big 2025. It's when these um, advisors and portfolio models start to look at crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum as an allocation Put 1% or 2% of your net worth into crypto. That's when the major unlocks happen. And those, those haven't really happened yet. You're just setting the stage for now advisors can talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. But the, the real unlock, and, and so that will start, but the, the real unlock will be when you start to have model portfolios include crypto. Right. Well, I think that will be a, a factor going forward. This is an angle also, Cantor Fitzgerald, CEO, is talking about big banks. Uh, TradFi basically may be going all sure. in. And you know, this is still some time coming because that's going to take some regulatory framework to be in place, but it could open the door pretty quickly after the election, providing you know who lands in the Senate, what we end up with uh, in the White House. Uh, when you look at the framework of traditional finance, and I'm sure you guys see this all the time because this could be your competitor one day, how are you guys building against that as a strategy for Kraken to kind of deal with that potential future? Sure. Well, today we view most of these banks as logical partners than they are competitors. Of course, they want to compete long-term, but uh, 
Kraken has 13 years building the tools to succeed in crypto. We have the full suite of tools that people need. If, if you're a big bank, and we see this actually more in Europe where Mika mm. has provided right. a path to regulatory clarity, you know, all the big banks want to figure out how do I offer crypto in a clean way to my customers. Kraken offers them the full suite of tools to do that. We offer custody, we offer exchange on both spot and futures and, and the full suite of tools to allow somebody to plug in and immediately have a crypto business that is best in class. So I view that more as an opportunity. If the US gets its act together and provides some regulatory clarity, we'll do exactly the same playbook in, in the US. And I think those big banks will find us to be a terrific partner. So the alignment there for what we're seeing within the existing exchanges out there could line up with the early needs of some of these banks who maybe really just sure. lack the technology and also maybe even the customer base, because that's another factor that could flow into this. Sure, can they convince their existing customers? Maybe, but they're definitely going to convince existing Kraken customers who also bank over there to say, oh yeah, well maybe that's a good you know selection for uh, my yep. strategy around holding crypto. You look at that and then you see some other things happening. This came from your CEO. Uh, and this was talking about the SEC's move on OpenSea as Wells Notice. Yes. And he, he makes a few points in here I think that are uh, reasonable. Uh, it's kind of uncharted territory. And the reason we talked about this pretty aggressively on our show is that this is crazy in the sense that we could see a move to what has always been the collector community, the fashion community, even big business around loyalty systems, because loyalty points could be looked at in this. What are you guys' take around all of this in terms of the SEC, SEC continuing its... its uh, <laughs> I, I, I look, I, I, think it's, it. I agree wholeheartedly with Jesse. This is crazy. And it's a continuation of this regulation by enforcement that Gary Gensler's SEC has put on. Um, you know, I, I would just ask, where are the rules? What are the set of rules that determined that OpenSea is offering access to securities and a Magic the Gathering cards trading right. place on eBay is is not selling securities? I think it's mm -hmm. there are no clear lines here. Every time the SEC is asked to put clear lines in place, they refuse and and point back to, you know, we'll let you know when we send you a Wells notice or we sue you. And I, you know, it's, it's um, we've talked about it in many occasions, but I think this is the open C one is particularly egregious in terms of how far they're, they're overreaching. All right, so we've kind of touched on NFTs a little bit. Obviously we know what the ETFs look like, what traditional trading is looking like. You look at it, tokenized assets in general, we're starting to see quite a bit of strategies being built in the crypto markets and also traditional finance moving in this direction. We've talked uh, to the securitized guys who are working with BlackRock. You have a, a handful of others that are starting to work in this place, including projects like Avalanche and many more that could line up around this. Is Kraken doing anything in this area around tokenized assets, whether it's securities, real world assets? Can you, can you tell us more there? Yeah, we haven't announced anything uh, that I can talk about specifically, but I think, I think you know, broadly when we think about it, our largest institutional partners hold a lot of capital uh, on our platform, in our custody offering. And if you've got two options, one of which is a stable coin that does not earn a yield, and the other is some kind of tokenized real world asset that does earn a yield, you're going to see an enormous gravitational shift to the one that earns a yield among sophisticated players. Sure. And so um, we spend a lot of time with the securitizes, with the Franklin Templetons of the world, trying to understand how those are different and how we can offer those to our customers. Uh, but, you know, I think in the absence of announcement, what I can tell you is we're spending a ton of time looking at the options because our customers are ultimately going to demand it. Yeah, for, for you guys listening in or watching right now, make sure, again, hit the like button. We did a full video with uh, Carlos from Securitize that breaks down a lot of that. Some of you guys may not be completely aware of what we're discussing right now. So go back yeah. and check that video out. It gives a good breakdown on what Securitize is doing with, with Biddle, which is involved directly with BlackRock. And you can kind of get an idea of where the future might be going, because this could really get into uh, a fairly quick acceleration over the next few years around how this technology could could really help. You know, I think it's going to see 
very significant adoption. And, and, and to your point, go straight to traditional finance. Yeah, for sure. Other things that I want to hit on, Tim, here is um, adoption cycles. And we see this with what's happening in the EU with Mika, the regulatory frameworks in place now. They're way ahead of us, almost light years. Then you look at what's going on in Japan and even in Hong Kong to a certain extent. Japan's FSA now wants to align crypto tax rates with traditional financial assets. So they're literally normalizing what's happening in the crypto market into traditional finance architecture that's being built around any kind of business, which doesn't even exist in, in our ecosystem here in the U.S. today. Do you think we can catch up on this idea uh, around what's happening in the rest of the world? It's a great question. I sure hope we. I sure hope we do. I'm an American. I believe that the American capitalist society is, has driven an enormous amount of innovation. Um, I. I don't see any signs today that we're moving in the right direction. And mm -hmm. so I think you need a a material change in policy at the SEC and and other, you know, regulatory bodies to take a forward-looking view on crypto. Uh, there are a lot of people who just want it to go away and, and look, yeah. it's been a long time, it's not going away. There's a huge number of Americans who want to own and, and for their lifetimes own crypto allocations and you can't stick your head in the sand and, and pretend it's going away. We need a forward-looking plan here. Yeah, I think you're leading into some, some heavy waters because you are right. We're dealing with uh, not only a a, I, I think there's two things here. One is a cultural mix that's starting to come to light, and then a legislative, you know, body that, you know, much like if you look at go all the way back to the, you know, creation of Section 230 for the kind of governing the internet, very similar in in what we're dealing with here, which was a lot of uh, lawmakers that didn't really have the full uh, gravitas of understanding what was happening. The difference here is this is now controlling two major areas. One is finance, which is did not exist before. And it's also starting to move into, if you think about it, even down into free speech, etc. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be decentralized uh, that are looking at. Here was a, a quote by Sean Adams, or Ryan Adams. Uh, he's hitting on, you know, the Telegram founders arrest, uh, VPN and uh, access in Brazil illegal. The, we know about the tornado cash issue. Point, point he's making is that Governments are starting to impede on a lot of these centralized parameters. And you look at decentralized as the future, many would look at Kraken and say, okay, well, in essence, that's a centralized you know, location. How would you guys look at dealing with people who are concerned about that in the future, especially with what you guys are doing? Sure. Kraken is a very mission-driven company. And so part of our mission is... Um, we need to build a bridge to allow people to adopt decentralized currencies, and uh, we will then burn the bridge. And so the notion, I, I don't think that's anytime soon, but I think, I think our core belief is decentralized options are going to continue to proliferate for many of the reasons you just outlined. It's yeah. a... You know, it's a hedge against governments printing money. It's a hedge against governments telling you all the things they don't want you to do or hear or say. And, um, you know, Kraken will continue to support the adoption of those things. I think we'd love to see full adoption of those, but that's a long way off. And so yeah. until that point, yes, we're a centralized option that allows people in regulated jurisdictions to comply with the laws and continue to get access to the crypto that they're demanding. Yeah. Well, I think you, you hit on it. It is a ways off. And even if you look at, I know for us inside the bubble, uh, once you step outside the bubble, you know, it's not so doom and gloom out there, you know, when, yeah. when you look at normal everyday life. But I think people, sometimes knowledge can also be a detriment. Just understanding what's happening at these micro levels can also, you know, it shakes you at the core, especially if you're a believer in free speech or you're a believer in freedom and those kind of things, which crypto really kind of... Um, gives you that a lot of other things do not. So I think that's the the angle. But I like the fact that you guys said the term right there, burn the bridge. That is a important statement because you're understanding where this is going. And I think that's a good thing for, a, 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 you know, what you guys are doing, especially at Kraken. I want to jump over to 
uh, we don't get into politics much, but I want to get your, your opinion on this because we know pretty much, I would say, the industry understands where Trump's uh, position has been. We do not know where uh, Kamala's position has been. Here was an article just on, from the Coinbase CLO. He's talking about, he's encouraged. There's actually been a campaign outreach with this. So here's my question. Do you feel that the Democrats may be softening their position and not just rubber stamping Biden's previous policy on where blockchain and crypto is going? What are your thoughts? Well, they're certainly not staking out a uh, a firm position on anti-crypto, which is, you know, you had a Biden administration largely led by Liz Warren's position and building, right. I'm building an anti-crypto army. And they seem to be stepping away from that. That's encouraging. I've been a little discouraged that they haven't come out in full uh, full-throated endorsement of we are going to support crypto in the same way that, that the other side of, of the election has. And so um, I would love to see, and I think you know the rest of the country wants to see, what are Kamala's real positions? How do they align with Joe Biden's administration and, and how are they going to be different? And I think getting real clarity on that is going to be the deciding factor in the election. Yeah, there's, I've talked to a couple of political analysts on this, um, many of which have kind of said, you know, if, if she makes the assessment that they want to go out pro-crypto, the requirement would be so great uh, in terms of a positioning, you know, statement or even a strategy would be so great to be able to really win any of the market. I think what many Democratic, you know, policy uh, people are saying now is just don't screw it up. You know, because there's a lot of Democrats that would vote for you that are also holders of crypto. But if you start to signal that, back to your point, that this is more of a, uh, you know, we're going to go and continue this pressure down approach, then that could end up losing her the election. Because there's a, 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 I've been surprised at how many single issue voters are really leaning into what's happening in the crypto space. And we're, we're doing a lot of man on the street kind of stuff out there. So it's uh, pretty impressive. I was looking at this right here. Trump is starting to edge. By the way, this is on poly market. What do you think about these prediction markets? Do you do you, do you guys get a chance to watch these much? Oh, I watch them all the time. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's terrific, right? I, I'm always looking for signal in in terms of like what's going to happen. I've loved 538 for years in terms of mm -hmm. just getting the best polling data. And I think when you start to attach money to outcomes, right. you really start to get. Um, even better precision. I think, you know, my challenge today is number one, it's, it's officially, it's not, no one in the U S is allowed to use it. So mm -hmm. you've got a limited base. I think the liquidity tends to be pretty light and you have a base that, that may, may view this almost as much as like a, a political, it may be more effective to put money into poly market to move odds than it is to make a political donation. And so yeah. I think as you see that grow, a lot of those growing pains issues go away, but I, I love poly market from that perspective. I've been surprised at how much mainstream media has started to reference poly market. Yeah. Uh, whether yeah. you look at, I, I don't want to say mainstream, but you hear CNBC talk about it quite a bit. TYT, which I would say is more, you know, alt in, in sense of, you know, secondary markets, but uh, they talk about it quite a bit. So it's interesting to me to see uh, that something that is based on um, blockchain is out yeah. there. Making it I think I, I, on that point, I think I saw that Bloomberg was adding polymarket data okay, into the into the feed. So it's you're that seeing that surprising. same thing. Yeah. That's crazy. Tim, it's been good having you. Uh, thank you so much for coming in today. Always love getting uh, caught up with what you guys are doing at Kraken. So we appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You bet. All right, so you guys are tuned in. Maybe on the podcast side of things, make sure and jump over to the YouTube channel. Get in on our Diamond Circle. That's our private member group. It's where we have an additional. Um, group over there where you guys can reach out to me and we have a little chat system in there. It's perfect. Uh, we leave a link down below so you can always join for free. It's very easy to set up. And if you're not following me out there on X, make sure and do that. It's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.